um, or on the call today, that feeling the same pain. And yet some teams and some organizations actually pull this off. So what is their secret? Well, that's what we're talking about today are three agile design principles that'll help any team, any organization to continuously evolve, innovate and operate in an agile manner. And so let's take a look at our agenda, what we're gonna be talking about as we unpack these. We're gonna start right out of the gate talking about these three agile design principles. And then we're gonna bring them to life with a potentially unexpected metaphor, a restaurant. And then we're gonna debrief with some interactivity, an interactive debrief yeah. challenge. And then we're gonna have some Q and A. Again, save up your questions for some lively discussion at the end. And what's beautiful is that with all the collective knowledge in the room, we can answer everyone's questions together. And then you're gonna receive an, a PDF copy of these slides where you'll get some more information around the tools that we bring up, as well as some free dandy resources. So let's jump in, starting with the design principles. So what are Agile design principles? Well, you can think of them as guidelines that provide a systematic approach for organizing a company structure so that decision-making power is actually pushed into and throughout the organization. So that the flow of decision-making, it, it actually becomes more like a web or that network you see on the left-hand side of the picture instead of that top-down hierarchy on the right. So during an agile transformation, as that graphic indicates, we're moving from the top-down decision-making flow to then following our North Star vision, which is distributed decision-making around the organization, that network effect that we're all longing to experience. And it's important to keep in mind that these principles, they're not hard and fast rules, right? They're just here for guiding your thinking and they're context dependent, which means how they look in your organization could be different from another organization in another industry of another size. So we need to keep that context dependence in mind, but they're powerful nonetheless. So let's look at what these three are, starting with number one, organize for cross-functionality and learning and not functional specialization. Let's unpack that. What does it mean to organize for cross-functionality? That means teams have the required cross-skilling. They've got the autonomy and the independence needed for delivering value, even if a person is off sick, if they happen to leave the organization, if they're unavailable for a special project, or if an unexpected bottleneck occurs, the team is still able to deliver value because there's enough shared collective knowledge for the work to get done together. And they have that mandate even to, and they're given the tools and, and necessary requirements to actually allow that cross-skilling to happen. And when it comes to learning, this is critical that teams have the structured time and mandates to not just get knowledge outside of their roles, but to actually learn how to learn together as a team. We're really good at learning as individuals to make sure that we can deliver in our role for our piece of the work. But it's critical that teams are given, again, the structure, time and mandate to learn how to learn together so that they can deliver as a whole and not just the sum of parts. Now the second critical principle is to form real teams and bring decisions to these teams because that's where the work is. This is where just-in-time decision-making comes in. It's so important that real teams are empowered to make those decisions right at the point of work with real-time data so they're better equipped to maximize adaptability, maximize speed, and maximize value delivery. And then what do we mean by real team? Well. It's a group of people who not only share a common goal, but they actually need each other. There's interdependence in their work. They don't, not just a group of people delivering work independently, but they work actually relies on each other to get done. That's critical. That's these design principles necessitate a real team or at least as close as you can get to a real team. Number three, continuously evolve structures and processes to optimize value and minimize waste. 
And that's when it comes to minimizing things like handoffs, wait time, defects, rework, and so on. Having that lean flavor brought in. So these are the three principles that we'll be exploring. And they're so powerful for building a team, building an organization that again, continually innovates, continually evolves and operates in that agile way, which companies are spending a lot of time and money working towards. Following these principles will help you realize that. And just to hit it home one more time, these are principles for guiding your thinking as a way for organizing your organizational structures, right? They're based on patterns of success, not hard and fast rules. And again, that context dependence, not every organization, for instance, can support real teams. And that's where you just need to be mindful of the trade-offs. But nonetheless, it's so worth trying these principles. As you'll see, we are going out to dinner where these principles will come to life. And the reason we're gonna be looking at a restaurant metaphor is because it's relatable to anyone on any team in any function or industry. And we all have a shared experience of going out to a restaurant. We've had good and bad experiences that we could also bring with us to this metaphor. But why are restaurants so relatable? Well, because just like with your organization, just like with your team, a restaurant has to stay relevant and they have to adapt in order to thrive in today's fast paced world of change. I mean, look at COVID. So many of us, especially restaurants, had to completely rethink how everything was done. So very relatable in that regard. Plus, they have to constantly revamp their product offering. They have to quickly respond to customer feedback. We know how devastating a bad Yelp review or a poor Google review could be. And they have to continuously evolve their processes, just like we do. And so to really compare and contrast life with following the principles versus not, we're gonna look at two restaurants in particular. We're gonna call it restaurant A, which is not built on our three agile principles, and then restaurant B, which is. Let's start by meeting restaurant A. Okay, so restaurant A uses the opposite of our principles. As you can see here, they organize for functional specialization to make sure only one person performs a role best. They bring all decisions to management just to keep everything secure. And they organize to keep predetermined processes going, not risking to adapt in the moment. They find evolving processes that's too risky. Let's just stick to what we know. How does their current state look when following these principles? Well, we find that people cannot cross train or flex to help in other roles. So let's say you walk into the restaurant and the hostess is not available or host is not available to seat you, but yet the bartender and waitress are free. Well, in this case, Nope, you can't flex. The waitress cannot seat anyone. The bartender cannot seat anyone. The person has to wait to the right person, the host or hostess is ready to seat them. Most decisions require manager approval. You have also that they have to follow a process with strict sequencing that the manager determined before the restaurant opened. So you cannot order food until your drinks are served, for instance. The team is not working as a team because they're stuck in rigid processes and roles. So this is interesting. Even if the team does have a shared goal, and even if their work is necessarily interdependent, it's the organizational structures that keep the team from functioning like a team. So let's explore this a bit further using some visualization tools, starting with something called a competency matrix, which can also be thought of as a skill profile. But this is a simple example and very easy for anyone to create for their teams. On the top row, you see the different skills required for running a restaurant. And on the left-hand side, you see the team members. And then you've got a color coding for their skill level, red for beginner, yellow for intermediate, green for expert, so let's take a look at how this competency matrix looks for restaurant A. 
All right, we see that Cecilia is an expert at seating guests. Karin is an expert at taking orders and taking money. <laughs> she takes drink orders, food orders, and money, and, and no one else is skilled in that role either. Bjorn is the bartender. All he does is prepare drinks, and that is it. Robin prepares food and prepares schedules. And Sophia, she cleans tables and delivers food. That's her jam. But notice what we don't see is yellow. Now, this is because everyone is a beginner skill level when it comes to the other roles. And they're not given time to learn other roles. They're only given time to get better, more efficient in their own role. And they're not even given flexibility to practice even if they wanted to. And this is really interesting implications for if something unexpected happens. If there's, for instance, a sudden rush or someone is sick or again, COVID that threw so many wrenches in people's gears could be pretty catastrophic. But sadly, this is how so many team competency matrices looks, including some software development teams. All right, let's look at another way to visualize restaurant A, something called the delegation matrix, which is inspired from management 3.0 which has got some cool tools as well, but we're gonna use it here to look at the level of empowerment that this team gets to enjoy. So this is what a delegation matrix looks like. We've got on the top row, different levels of delegation, or you can think of it again as different levels of empowerment. On the left-hand side, we've got the manager making all the judgment calls where you have level number one, the manager makes a directive and just tells the team, this is how it is. Level two is where the manager makes a directive and sells it to the team just to increase buy and make it look like a really good idea to ensure the adoption by the team. And then level three, consult. This is where the team is consulted for their input, but it's still the manager making the ultimate decision. Number four, Consensus, agreement, meeting in the middle. And then five, six, and seven is where the teams have real empowerment. Advise is when the team makes the decision, the manager gives from some advisement. Number six is where the team makes a decision and the manager inquires after the decision is made. Hey, where did you all land? And then number seven is delegate. That's when the manager has complete, or I'm sorry, that's where the team has complete authority to make a decision. And the manager only follows up if he or she needs to. And then we've got some decision areas on the left-hand side. And so we can make transparent the level of empowerment, as you can see here for restaurant A. So we notice that the team has no empowerment. They're told what to do largely. They're sold some ideas around front of house workflow, but still have no say. And then even the kitchen where the chef should be master, nope, it's the manager at the end of the day who determines the kitchen workflow. And yes, the chef is open to give some advisement, but at the end of the day, it's still the manager making the shots. So very interesting data so far. Let's look at what's called the value stream map, which is the third visualization tool. And a value stream map is awesome. It really makes transparent the effectiveness of a given process when it comes to productivity. And as you'll see, the simple visualization also will tell us a lot about restaurant A. But before we look at restaurant A's specific value stream map, we're just gonna do a really short primer in case anyone on the call is new to value stream mapping. So you can think of value stream maps as a diagram of the steps involved in the material and information flow of a process, all the way from order to delivery. It helps you to visualize the steps needed to deliver a finished product and service, as well as the wait times in between each step. So if this was the value stream map of a restaurant, you can think of the top part in green as representing the gaps of time where the customer's actually receiving value, such as getting seated ordering food, eating food, even getting to pay the bill. These are all value added activities. Whereas the bottom part in red reflects the time that the customer has to wait, which includes waiting to be seated. 
waiting for their food or drinks to come, or even waiting for the bill. Now, when both parts are taken together, we notice that a customer spends here in this visualization 35 minutes in this restaurant where only 10 minutes are spent on activities that actually deliver any customer value, whereas the rest of the customer's time is spent waiting. Now, before we make any judgment calls about, whoa, this is bad, or oh, this is good, a value stream map is simply only meant to visualize enough for good questions to be asked. For instance, why is there all this waiting time? What might be happening? What might we reduce happening so that we can make the wait times even shorter? Do we even need wait times at all? How might we rethink the process to eliminate some of the wait time altogether or some of the gaps altogether? So just hold on to that as we take a look at the value stream map for restaurant A. All right, so we see here that there is indeed a lot of red, which in this case is pink. We've got a lot of wait times happening as they wait to get seated, wait for a server, and then waiting for drinks and food prep and so on. And then we see again the value added activities on top where we're not gonna draw any conclusions yet. We're gonna wait to see restaurant B's to compare and then determine some types of questions we could ask around these different wait times experienced by restaurant A and the implications. Okay, so I just threw at you a lot of information, a lot of data around restaurant A. So let's step back and think about what we just saw. And what would your experience be like if you were to walk into restaurant A? What would it be like? What would you experience first and foremost? Which would be handoffs? At least that's what comes to my mind first after seeing those visualizations. I mean, you'd be again met by a host or a hostess and then handed off to a drinks order taker and then a server and so on. You'd have higher wait times right? Because staff can't flex in order to meet the needs of the customers coming in. So if the host or hostess is in the bathroom or something, let's say, again, the waitress, the bartender, no one else would be able to seat the customer. Or similarly, if, if the bartender's interrupted or the waitress, you couldn't have any other role flex to help the customer. So that would lead to even longer wait times. And diminished quality, Lots of handovers, so odds are very high for information to get lost, like allergy information. If a daughter had a peanut allergy, the hostess was told, well, in a setup like this, odds are the information could get lost by the time the order got to the kitchen. And the quality of overall service would also be diminished. Now, question of reflection for you, is any of this relatable to your team experience? Do you have a similar setup to this? Now, this anti-pattern that you're seeing, it actually has a name. We call it mini waterfall, which is a common anti-pattern that happens when there's all these types of handoffs with what you're seeing here and knowledge silos. When team members are not able to become cross-skilled and each one has their own expertise within the team, and the work item has to move from one member to the next, to the next, to the next, because everyone has their own special knowledge area and contribution to the work. And the end result is that teams turn into a linear system, not agile system. It turns into a fragile system that requires each member, again, to complete each step before moving on to the next. So many waterfall is happening. Lots of software teams do this as do other teams wanting to become agile, no matter what your domain or function is. Agile HR, agile finance, this is an anti-pattern that affects everyone if they're not careful. All right, so let's meet restaurant B. And let's take away some of those learnings with us and bring it into restaurant B. And then after restaurant B, we're gonna compare and contrast the two. Let's dive in. Restaurant B uses our principles. They do organize for cross-functionality and learning, not specialization. They do bring decisions to where the work is. 
so that those just-in-time decisions can be made, that teams are empowered to pivot on their feet and meet the customer's needs as they come up. And they continuously evolve structures and processes, again, to optimize value and optimize the flow of work through the system, minimizing waste, minimizing those handoffs, waste time, wait times, and rework, and so on. And I just want to give a shout out to a term that could be new to some of y'all. It's T-shaped, which is another way of thinking of cross-skilling. Now, with T-shaped teams, they have people who possess a strong primary skill that represents that vertical, longer line in the T. And then they also have a broader knowledge of other domains within their area of work. That's where you see that good enough for now or part of the T that they've got other areas that they're skilled in. And so the current state of restaurant B, more T-shaped, is that people start, yes, in a predetermined role, just like restaurant A, but they can learn other roles during downtime so they can actually become more T-shaped. They're not just stuck in a box, stuck in their swim lane, right? They can grow and develop in their skill set and contribute as needed to the other roles. Restaurant B also enjoys a high level of delegation. So they are trusted, they're empowered. We'll look at their delegation matrix and, and see that, that they are trusted with a lot of decision-making and there are clear parameters for where things need to get escalated to management. Yes, there are some guardrails, so to speak, but they're very empowered compared to team A. And they're a real team. They've got the autonomy to evolve their processes when conditions change. And again, within the predetermined parameters, all transparent, all agreed upon up front. And lastly, people can pair up or swarm on an issue at the same time without needing to follow strict sequencing or gates in order to do something. So let's take a look at the similar tools that we saw with restaurant A and look at how they play out in restaurant B, starting with the competency matrix. Ooh, let's look at this one. What do we see here? Well, a lot more yellow and green, that's for sure. And it's because people do have knowledge of other roles and they're given time to learn and practice this knowledge together. So even if they're not expert in the other roles, they have enough so that the team can continue delivering value even if a bottleneck happens, team members leave and so on, the team goes on, they, they thrive in spite of. And with these unexpected things happening, they would do a great job being flexible. And this is how many team competency matrices could look if they wanted the same benefits that restaurant B enjoys. What about delegation matrix? Let's take a look at that. You'd see a lot more empowerment, okay? So menu changes, the team has complete autonomy over those. Whereas when it comes to, for instance, the uh, who to hire, they're asked to consult with the manager so that they can um, give their input. The manager makes the ultimate decision. But with the other areas, schedule swaps, the front of house workflow where the customers are, kitchen workflow, they have, the team has a lot of influence. They want consensus around the work front of house workflow, but then inquire and delegation with the menu changes, schedule swaps, and kitchen flow which is awesome, a lot more empowerment than we saw with restaurant A. Now, what about the value stream map? This is where things get interesting. Okay, so this is the value stream map of restaurant B. Well, if you remember restaurant A, you're gonna notice a lot less pink. Check that out. You can see, whoops, that folks are very short with the wait time. They get a table quickly, they get seated quickly, read menus quickly, order drinks quickly. And yes, the same amount of time is required for preparing food and drinks, but yet the wait times overall, a lot shorter. Look at that. So you can see how some quest good questions could emerge, for instance, from restaurant A. If you think of these as two similar teams, both teams map out their uh, value stream map to make obvious, their process that they follow and the wait times, make that clear and transparent, and then compare and learn from each other. Like, wow, how were you able to get so much shorter wait times in these steps? 
how might we reduce and so on. So good information, good questions come from this type of visualization. So let's do a similar reflection. Now that you see these transparent ways of exploring what restaurant B would be like, think about if you walked in, how would your experience be? Well, for starters, fewer handoffs. You'd be met by a host who could actually pivot to take your order and even assist you by taking payment. You'd have lower wait times. The staff would be positioned to pivot so customers, they didn't have to wait for the right person to free up. I mean, how many times have all of us been waiting to make a payment at a department store or a kiosk and there's nobody standing behind it to help us? We look around and there's a lot of staff just standing around but no one behind the counter. It's probably because they're similar to restaurant A. Whereas if you are in a restaurant B type of setting, you'd have somebody there, the first available person, boom, there to help you because they're cross-skilled. They can jump in and help as needed. You'd have higher quality experience since there are those fewer handoffs. And again, you've got that shared knowledge. It's a cross-skilled team, lower odds of lost information and greatly improved quality of service. Big differences, big differences. So any of this relatable to your team experience? Are you more like restaurant A or restaurant B? So for this, we're going to play a game. As we just explore the implications of these two different restaurants following two different sets of design principles. The game is called Who Would Win? And the mission is simple. I'm going to present you with a question. The answer is either A or B. And what you are going to do is write in the chat what you think the answer is. And our fabulous Pernilla is going to share what the result is at the end of each question. And I'll have a super quick debrief. And after this, we will do some Q&A. So are you ready, Miss Pernilla? OK. So let's go to the first question. Boom. Yep. Whoa, here it is. Okay. Which restaurant would have happier customer when it comes to all three? Number one, time to be seated, time to order drinks and food, and time to receive drinks and food, A or B? Drum roll. What do you see in this, Pernilla? Well, I'm seeing B. Yeah. <laughs> Agnes, Daniel, Mikael, Jenny, B. <laughs> yes, exactly. Since there are less handoffs, less wait times, restaurant B will be able to take orders and deliver the fastest and take the payment fastest. And this view is great. You can see how much faster the process is. Beautiful, beautiful. Well done. Okay, question number two. What customers want to order as soon as they sit down because they know what they want already. So the question is, who would take orders fastest, A or B? Drum roll. What do you see, Ms. Pernilla? Oh, I see B. <laughs> oh, clear winner. Restaurant yeah. B would take orders fastest because more people are trained and permitted to flex from their specialist roles so they could actually help out. Paolo and Yuan can just slip in and help folks. Whereas restaurant A, they can't. All right, let's go to the next question. Dun, dun, dun. There is a dramatic change in customer taste. Who would pivot the fastest? Okay, A or B, Ms. Pernilla, what do you see? I see the letter B. Clearly the winner. Because the people doing the work, they are the ones most sensitive to the fluctuations in customer's taste. And they're therefore best positions to discern what should be next on the menu. So perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, last question. There is an unexpected extra busy season. Who is best positioned to keep up with demand? Let's see the answer. <gasps> well, I see a pattern. <laughs> you see a pattern. Yeah, yeah, I see a pattern of bees. So it's a say. pattern of bees. It's a swarm of bees. It's a swarm of bees. There it's you a go. Swarm of bees. <laughs> it's because of their T-shaped team and ability to adapt to the needs. Restaurant B is a clear winner. 
they both in this case take advantage of their cross-skilling and the fact that they're empowered to actually make decisions and they know what decisions they're empowered to make. That's the beauty of the delegation matrix is it makes super transparent, not only the level of delegation, but specifically what decisions am I empowered to make? Huge, huge. Ah, so well done, well done with the swarm of bees. So reflection, so just take a moment, let this sink in. How might all this apply to you? Is your team or organization more like restaurant A or restaurant B? And if you're a manager, are you more like manager A or are you more like manager B? Or do you want to be more like manager B, but you're not empowered? And that could be another scenario. And then to shift your team or organization to the principles of B, what would you change first? What would you change second? Just to get your gears turning. All right. So that was the, you get what you organized for webinar conversation around the two restaurants before we dive into q a just wanted to walk you through the metaphor explore those two scenarios either using the principles actively or not ending with a fun swarm of bees and yeah just inviting some interactivity now and some questions so i'll go ahead thank you and so much carrie thank you so much of course of course well thank you I would have to say, you know, I, the, the most fun uh, question came during your first question. Ah. It's actually a comment from Michael, but, but he, he actually wrote that um, he actually visited restaurant A while he was on a ski trip to Austria. So now I, you know, it got me thinking, we need to know where is it because we all need to go there. I want to see it. Do you want to share something regarding that, Michael? I can <clears throat> I can just share that uh, that everyone had had their specific responsibility in the restaurant and it was completely chaos in my mind because yeah, as a customer you wouldn't you didn't have any like dialogue with one person so yeah, it was a lot of mix ups and uh, yeah 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 and, and it's amazing how obvious it is in a restaurant setting but so many of us do it in an organizational setting with five and how we run teams, how we run yeah. departments. Yeah. But to feel directly the pain, well, it sounds like you experienced it firsthand. Remember to share later so we can all go there. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, uh, next question uh, we've got from Jenny. Do you want to, uh, do you want to ask the question, uh, Jenny? Yes, I can do that. What is the biggest challenge for restaurant B as you see it? The biggest challenge for restaurant B, I'd say, would be the mandate from on high. Like oh, that there's... was my thought as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. To get the, the culture um, to make people, um, it's okay to make wrong decisions or do wrong, you can always correct it. So I guess the mandate and the culture yeah it's challenging so like we've got some scrum masters on the call and you can do to a certain degree create a restaurant b type of experience within your sphere of influence but again to a degree it makes the job of a scrum master or a leader who's trying to lead that way really stressful because then that leader or scrum master becomes the buffer the shielding of the team to protect them from mm -hmm. the ultimate organizational culture I think there's a good saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So even <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a good one. Or, or eats the scrum master or eats the leader. <laughs> He's trying to be like B. And so yeah. it really needs organizational alignment to be realized in the fullest business agility sense. But it is possible to create pockets of it, right? Which is how then you can create that tipping point that Malcolm Gladwell refers to by starting small, creating small pockets of positive B-likeness, 
creating success stories, sharing the wins, sharing the good practices, having it spread. It is possible to create momentum internally that way, bottoms up, but it's so much easier top down when it comes to the mandate side. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Jenny. Um, we also have a question from Agnes. Do you want to uh, take that, Agnes? Yes, um, if someone wants to change from A to B, what can be the hardest challenge to do that transition? Ooh, I'd, I'd say it dovetails off of Jenny's comment around the leadership by overcoming the, man, the lack of mandate, if you will, because there's only so much change that can happen unless it's supported from the higher level decision makers. So I'd say the roadblock would be higher leadership and the higher level leadership not recognizing how their behaviors and their decisions cascade down to impact the operational level. So creating a red thread is sometimes super helpful, meaning taking anchoring operational level results to the overall company mission, vision, strategy, and showing that clear line, which makes visible whether or not there's actually a helpful strategy, whether or not there's actually a helpful mission, whether or not a red line could even be made. And that right now with the company I'm working with, they uncovered that their mission is so vague and their strategy is so vague that a lot of folks on the operational level are kind of flying blind. So from the leadership perspective, they're not delivering. But then we really made it obvious through just visualization of, well, your mandate's really vague. <laughs> your mission, vision, and strategy is super vague. So if we could create better alignment, it naturally brings uh, the lack of alignment and the lack of transparency to light. And that's the beauty of agility. So a lot of times as these things do surface, people naturally start solving them. So it's making transparent that disconnect without anyone feeling shamed or called out, right? Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of some yeah. of these tools. So I don't, is that kind of helpful? I feel like I kind of rambled at the end and that wasn't my intent. Oh, that was clear what you said. Uh, I'm, I'm only thinking about the resistance, what uh, people show uh, if, if we have those two uh, together, uh, do you still hold your view that it's still the management and um, the vision they create that is hardest to uh, change. Yeah, it, some of the answers context dependent. So if, if I just go on my limited experience for patterns that I've seen, just calling out that this is just coming from me, this isn't like thus say a the agile community. But um, um, a lot of times it for me personally, it's been, lack of clear mandate from the business. So they just bring in a consultant, just say, make this magic happen. But when it comes to execution and buy-in, the early adopters will run with it. But some of the resistors resist because there was no organizational mandate to really compel them forward. And so you get okay. kind of mixed yeah. results. I yeah. can relate to that in private life as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, and um, obviously in, um, in company uh, environments as well. Yeah, it really takes a, um, a lot of alignment. What company I'm currently working with, they are in serious financial situation. Like this is a make it or break it agile transformation. And it's forced them to be really aligned. So it's mm. in some sense, the easiest transformation I've ever worked with because everyone there's super clear that this is make it or break it for us as a company mm -hmm. and we are going to empower you frontline folks we're bringing in a coach for this small period of time you better get what you need out of her <laughs> because mm -hmm. we're going to be going live soon with this new way of working with no managers i mean they're going full out and so when you've got that level of alignment that clear of a mandate from all over and it's clear the role I'm meant to play, like all that clarity and transparency is beautiful and creates real fast change. That's great to hear. Yeah, good Being a, <laughs> an agile student <laughs> myself, and there's future for that. Yeah. 
I can see also a challenge like going from restaurant A to restaurant B, a changing mindset as well. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people maybe can have a comfort in just uh, handing out drinks uh, and then going from that to uh, be more T-shaped. That's also like a challenge mm -hmm. uh, of mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Learn. like I, I'm the number one drink guy. That is my identity. Yes. Yeah, the knowledge hoarding, as, yeah. as we sometimes call it, because people get their identity from that, like you're saying, Daniel, with I'm the number one drinks guy. And then there's that resentment and feeling threatened. Mm -hmm. That happens sometimes when you go to a flatter organizational structure and there's no more managers. What do we do with the managers? Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of folks, when they get that promotion, that's it becomes part of who they are. They're a people leader, but now they need to lead in a servant kind of way in perhaps an entirely different role. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It, it's mindset. So that's super important. I'm glad you brought that up because it's one thing to do agile and it's another thing to be agile. And that mindset mm -hmm. shift takes time. And that is one thing I'm worried about with this organization that's in trouble is that they're des they're in the startup mindset, even though they're global, they have a startup mindset of we just need to try new things and just make this work. But yet they're using the old school big bang approach where suddenly mm -hmm. folks are finding themselves in these new roles. And I'm really working on helping them to see that the mindset shift is more important than getting all of the front mm -hmm. end training right. Right. Oh, I totally agree. Oh, they're they're on they're on a journey. They're slowly realizing it. They're slowly, but it's like Daniel saying, it takes a bit of time. It was just one quick life metaphor. I as an experiment during COVID, I trained for a half marathon. I was a couch potato who hated running, but I I was desperate because I was bored. I was like, I just want to try something different, and I had to get into the marathon mindset right? Very different, very different from I hate exercise and I just want to do my whatever mm -hmm. to suddenly seeing things from this big picture perspective, much more integrated. I, I had to shift and it's hard to shift mm -hmm. mindset. So I'm so happy again, Daniel, that you brought it up. And I'm sure a lot of us could think of life experiences where we were challenged mm -hmm. to have that empathy for what we're asking okay. teams to do. And uh, you mentioned mindset, which is really important. I do agree. But this um, uh, concept of learning something again, so not being enough with what uh, someone has, but needing to learn something in a structured set, maybe. So that can be hard for uh, some people as well. Um, now we talked about a restaurant maybe in, in a company where people have to learn um, all the time, it's not that tough, but in a restaurant to learn something again, uh, maybe they uh, that, that evokes uh, resistance. Oh, what, what do you mean? Tell me more about learning things again. Like learning things, I, I, I think that uh, sometimes people have this feeling, uh, this, uh, uh, negative um, feeling about uh, schools that they were taught something um, or they have to earn a certificate that takes time that takes a lot of effort um, to learn a new skill uh, takes um, takes a lot of effort and they don't want to do that sometimes uh -huh. but with the agile um, environment that's inevitable. Uh, people have to learn all the time and this concept of lifelong learning uh, is in the air all the time so would you say Agnes that there is a fear of failure in that is that included in that that people uh, who are afraid of of you know going back to school that they are afraid mm -hmm. of failing somehow is, is that a part of what you're saying it can because, be but, yeah. uh, investing time and effort, mm -hmm. you know, to to grow, to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also and think that, that I also uh, think that mindset is 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 a part of it. We, we I think we come back to mindset all the time because mm -hmm. um, it is very easy to see a person who 
are like, I am a front end developer. Yes. I'm hired to, and uh, I'm a part of this team to write JavaScript code, you know. Um, and I used to say that, no, you are not here to produce code. You are here to help the team solve a problem. That will very likely include you writing JavaScript code, if that is your specialty. But it is not the primary reason why you are here. We don't mm. exist as a company for you to write code. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good example of a well-articulated having had a mindset shift. They clearly, that is a great agile mindset way of framing learning. You're in, you're in that you're here to solve a problem together. So what might I learn to help my team solve problems better? And that'll take you way beyond just mastering JavaScript. It'll take you into other areas that'll help with your contribution. So really good concrete example, Daniel. Thank you. Any other questions? Good conversation. Yeah, thank you. I love people chiming in and yeah. jumping in. Please yeah. keep doing it. There are no other questions that I've picked up, but you, because you're all jumping in as, as you like here. So there are no other questions in the chat that I have picked up. Please uh, let me know if I've missed something, if there is anything else that you want to ask or comment on. Yeah, please. No? Michael, I saw you unmute. Come on, dude. <laughs> oh, I just want to say thanks for a fantastic, great webinar. Good. You're welcome. Glad you liked it. And and you will um you will make a PDF of the presentation, Carrie. Yes. And so we'll make sure that you all get that PDF when this is done. I have also tried recording this, so hopefully we've got technology on our side. So um we will send that out as well so, so you, you. yeah so you can all you know go go back and see if there is anything and i'm i'm really thinking that those final three questions carry at the end yeah. that that is something that we always have to reflect on not not just today but also next week and next month to continuously keep up with um where we are and where we want to be yeah yeah, it's so easy to get caught in the day today and lose sight of what it is we're ultimately trying to achieve. Mm. Where do we ultimately want to go together? And mm -hmm. like I said, what are we ultimately trying to achieve together? And how do we keep fostering that togetherness mindset yeah. instead of it's all about me and my learning and my career and my role, my swim lane? Yeah, big shift. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you for guys. The inspiration. <laughs> Do what did you say? I'm sorry. Thank you for your, the inspiration. Oh, mm. you're welcome, Jenny. Thank you for tuning in and everyone on the call. I see there's 21. Uh, no, that's number of chats. So there's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we, we've got a small group, which, you know, is very good because that means yeah. people are more free to talk, which is yeah. very good if you ask very me. Cool. Awesome. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to end the recording here and uh, we wish you uh, a happy day, continued day. I hope you've got sunshine, yeah. and krokus and skilla in your lawn. <laughs> That's what we hope for now as Swedes. We go crazy, right? <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.